A very good evening aspirants. Welcome to the Daily Hindu News Analysis brought you by Shankar AS Academy for the date of 22nd July 2023. Displayed here are the news articles we are going to discuss today. Now without wasting any time, let us get into our discussion. Take a look at this article. The news here is that Rajasthan Assembly passed two bills, namely Rajasthan Minimum Guaranteed Income Bill and Rajasthan Public Examination Bill. While the first bill ensures guaranteed social security to the people of Rajasthan, the second bill increases the punishment for leaking question papers of exams. This is all about the news article. In our discussion today, we will focus on Rajasthan Minimum Guaranteed Income Bill. First, what is the objective of the bill? See, the bill aims to cover entire adult population of the state with the guaranteed wages or pension. Now, let us see what are the important provisions of the bill. See, the bill has three broad categories. First one is the right to minimum guaranteed income. The second one is the right to guaranteed employment. And the third one is right to guaranteed social security pension. Under this right to minimum guaranteed income, each adult citizen of Rajasthan has been guaranteed a minimum income for 125 days per year. Now coming to the right to guaranteed employment. As a part of this program, the government appointed a program officer. This program officer ensures that work site is within the radius of 5 kilometers from the job area. Also, if the program officer failed to provide employment within 15 days, then the applicant will be entitled to unemployment allowance. This unemployment allowance will be on weekly basis. So through these provisions, the bill ensures the right to guaranteed employment. Finally coming to the right to guaranteed social security pension. Under the bill, the aged, disabled, widows and single women get a minimum pension of rupees 1000 per month. Importantly, the pension will be increased at a rate of 15% per year. These are some of the important provisions of the scheme. This scheme is in national news because Rajasthan has paved for minimum income and guaranteed employment for the people of Rajasthan. This will set an example for nation. Now let us conclude this discussion and move on to our next discussion. Take a look at this news article. According to the article, the Southern Bench of National Green Tribunal took up a Suomoto case based on the study conducted by Chennai Climate Action Group. The study dealt with air pollution in Ennur Manali industrial region of Chennai. The NGT National Green Tribunal in its award ordered two things. Firstly, it ordered Central Pollution Control Board to examine and revise the emission protocols. Secondly, it asked the CPCB to ensure the functioning of online continuous emissions monitoring system. OCEMS. NGT also appointed a joint committee and this committee found that six large PSUs that function in Ennur Manali industrial region to comply with national ambient air quality standards that is prescribed by CPCB. This is all about the news article. In this context, let us cover CPCB and national ambient air quality standards in our discussion today. Let us start with Central Pollution Control Board. It is a statutory body under Ministry of Environment, Forest and Climate Change. It was constituted under Water Prevention and Control of Pollution Act 1974. Further, CPCB was entrusted with the powers and functions under Air Prevention and Control of Pollution Act 1981. The CPCB has two important functions. Firstly, it focuses on control and prevention of water pollution. Secondly, it focuses on prevention and control of air pollution. So overall, it has responsibility for prevention and control of water and air pollution. This is very important regarding prelims perspective. In addition to these two important functions, it has some miscellaneous functions. Like CPCB provides technical services to Ministry of Environment under Environment Protection Act 1986. Then CPCB coordinates the activities of state pollution control boards and resolves any disputes among them. 
also note that CPCB creates manuals and guidelines to prevent pollution. Finally, CPCB also create awareness through mass media. This is all about the functions of CPCB. Let us see the organizational structure. CPCB has a chairman and a member secretary. It has 37 divisions and 9 regional directorates. I have displayed the organizational chart here. You can go through it. Now we have covered CPCB. Let us take a look at National Ambient Air Quality Standards NAAQS. These standards are applicable nationwide. These air quality standards are created by CPCB under Air Pollution Act 1981. The current National Ambient Air Quality Standards were notified on 2009 by CPCB. This consists of 12 pollutants. Take a note. Particulate matter 10, particulate matter 2.5, nitrous oxide, sulfur dioxide, carbon monoxide, ozone, ammonia, lead, benzene, benzopyrin, arsenic and nickel. This is all about National Ambient Air Quality Standards. So we have seen Central Pollution Control Board, its functions, its statutory provisions, organizational structure of Pollution Control Board and then some important points about National Ambient Air Quality Standards. This is all regarding this discussion. Take a look at this article. Let me summarize this for you. Tamil Nadu Public Works Department is creating a new museum in Tirunelveli district. This museum will be called as Purunai Archaeological Museum. So this museum will help us to learn about the history and culture of these regions through artifacts. In our discussion today, we will see about the significance of museums in preserving the rich heritage and history of our India. See, the role played by museums in preserving history can be understood from several perspectives. Let us see them one by one. The first one is the role played by museums in conservation and preservation. Museums are responsible for the care and conservation of artifacts, artworks, documents and other historical objects. They employ specialized techniques and technologies to ensure the long-term preservation of these items. They help in protecting them from deterioration and damage. By maintaining these collections, museums help safeguard the tangible elements of our past so that our future generations can learn about it. Second important role played by museums is preserving the rich cultural heritage. See, the museums collect and display artifacts and artworks that reflect the diverse aspects of our society, right? So this allows visitors to connect with their roots and develop a sense of identity and cultural pride. The third perspective is the role played by museums in aiding education and research. Actually, museums serve as educational institutions, providing valuable resources for researchers, students and general public. They offer opportunities for in-depth study and exploration of cultural events, historical events, societal changes and other artistic developments. So in essence, museums help us have a deeper understanding of our collective history. Another perspective is that museum helps in awareness and public engagement. As we know, museums have interactive displays and exhibit the present history in an engaging way. So this will help the common public understand and appreciate our history in better form. Finally, the museums also inspire creativity and innovation. By studying the past, the public can draw inspiration for solving modern day challenges and creating a better future. Lastly, the museum play an important role in building the social cohesion and inclusivity. See, the museums offer spaces where people from diverse backgrounds can come together and share their history. Through this, museums help build a social cohesion. They also provide places for cultural exchange which help in building a mutual understanding between different sections of society. So these are the roles played by museums. With this, let us conclude this discussion and move on to our next discussion. Take a look at this front page article. Yesterday, the central government informed the Bombay High Court that it will not notify a fact check unit until September 4. See, recently the central government amended information technology rules to establish a fact check unit. 
This unit will help identify fake social media content about the central government. Now we shall see why did the government cannot form a fact check unit. Currently, the Bombay High Court is hearing a petition filed by several newspapers and TV channels. This is because the new amendment rules require social media intermediaries to censor or to modify the content that relates to central government. See, to look after this task, the central government has proposed to establish a fact check unit. This FCU will flag online posts about the central government that are false or misleading. Opposing this move, several associations and TV channels approached Bombay High Court. As the case about fact check unit is still pending before the Bombay High Court, the central government informed the court that it will not notify a fact check unit until September 4. This is all about the news. In this discussion, we will understand about the recent amendments made in the IT rules. Now before going into the discussion, the syllabus relevant to this topic is highlighted here. You can go through it. Now let us start with IT rules. On April 6, Central Government notified Information Technology Amendment Rules 2023. See, this is the second time the Central Government made amendment to Original IT Rules. Note that the Original IT Rules was notified in February 2021. Subsequently, the rules were amended first on October 28, 2022. And recently, on April 6, the rules were again amended for second time. Now we shall see the recent amendments made in the IT rules. So, as per the amendments, the social media intermediaries are now obligated to inform their users that they cannot display, modify, publish or share any information which is identified as fake or false or misleading. Here the information means any information related to the business of central government. To put it simply, the new amendment rules require the social media intermediaries to censor or modify any content regarding to central government if the content is identified as fake or false or misleading as we seen before. Note another important point here. The social media intermediaries have to inform their users about new requirements through internal rules or regulations. See the requirements have to be informed to the users either in English or any language specified in the 8th schedule. Now who will be tasked with the identification of fake contents? See the identification of false or fake information will be done by fact check unit. This unit will be formed by central government. Note that this unit is not yet established. As we saw in the news, the central government has put a hold on the creation of this fact check unit. So we have to wait and see what will happen in the future. Now coming back to the amendments. The amendment also stated that if social media intermediaries failed to carry out obligations under the new IT rules, then they lose their immunity from civil or criminal liabilities. See, as per the section 79 of IT Act and IT rules, the social media intermediaries are immune from hosting third-party data or information. For example, if a social media intermediary like Twitter hosts some religious hatred content, they cannot be responsible for such content. This is because Twitter is just acting as an intermediary for such content. In other words, Twitter is not liable for hosting such religious hatred statement. But the new amended IT rules stated that if social media intermediaries failed to carry out obligations of censoring or modifying the fake content related to central government, then they lose their immunity from any civil or criminal liability for hosting any third party content on their platforms. Because of this controversial provisions, several associations and TV channels approached the Bombay High Court. So we have to wait and watch what will be the final decision of the court. Now why did the government introduce such rules? See in the age of internet and social media, fact checking has become an essential tool to combat the spread of fake news. In India, over 75 crore people use the internet. So it becomes easier for fake content to spread rapidly. At these times, fake messages may lead to confusion and chaos in society. It even ends up in violence. 
considering all these facts central government felt the need for comprehensive rules to curb the fake news so because of this only it rules were amended to establish a fact check unit which will help to identify fake social media content about the central government and that's all regarding this discussion let us move to our next discussion take a look at this editorial article it talks about the manipur issue see the violence in the state began on may 3 2023 however the issue didn't gain widespread attention until a video of mob assaulting a woman surfaced in july 19 During this period an internet shutdown has been continued in Manipur so the article tries to explain why internet ban will not restore peace in Manipur so we will analyze this news in our discussion before that syllabus relevant to this article is highlighted here for your reference see internet shutdown is defined as an intentional disruption of internet or electronic communications for specific population or location to exert control over the flow of information it can happen at national level also where users across the entire country cannot access the internet remember till 2017 internet shutdowns were imposed largely under section 144 of crpc section 144 of crpc gave the police and district magistrate the powers to prevent unlawful gathering of people and also to direct any person to abstain from certain activity currently internet shutdown is governed under this rule only as per the rules only the home secretary of the union or state can issue such order the order has to be reviewed by a committee within 5 days such order shall not be in operation for more than 15 days in inevitable circumstances the order to suspend telecom services may be issued by an officer ranked joint secretary or above but such inevitable circumstances are not defined under the rules however such order will be subjected to confirmation from home secretary of the union government the order will cease to exist in case of failure to obtain the confirmation this is how the internet shutdown is governed in india right apart from this section 69 of information technology act gives the government the power to block particular websites and not the internet as a whole having this basic understanding let us see what the article is trying to say see the internet shutdown in manipur first enforced on may 3 the prohibition covered all web traffic and mediums of connectivity this order was issued by manipur state home minister but the order was renewed each time it expired with minor changes in the dates This indicates that ban is indefinite. Around May 19, the petitions challenging these orders were filed in High Court of Manipur. On July 7, High Court issued orders for partial restoration of internet in Manipur. Note that this is only partial restoration and the internet shutdown even continues today. See, all these were violative of the judgments given by Supreme Court. in anuradha basin versus union of india case supreme court held that access to information through internet is a fundamental right and any restriction on internet access by the government must be temporary and limited in scope the court also said that the government's orders restricting the internet should be subjected to review by the courts it also directed the authorities to pass internet suspension orders with respect to only those areas where there is absolute necessity for such restrictions all these rulings were violated in case of manipur the author further says that misinformation spreads rather than diminishes in face of internet ban secondly the information flows are required to ensure that state and central governments are held accountable for taking steps to ensure truth justice and reconciliation accountability will come only when the state government and central government implement the supreme court judgments regarding this issue that's all about this discussion let us move towards our next discussion this column article says that the courts should adopt a clear headed approach while considering the grant for bail it says that the bail should not be denied merely because the police objected to strongly 
This is the crux of the article given here. In this context, let us quickly go through the issues in bail law and some of the Supreme Court rulings regarding it. See, the bail is a temporary release from police custody. So the accused person will be available whenever he is needed for the investigation. So it is actually a condition where liberty is granted to the accused. It is also a constitutional right under Article 21. But the matter of right to claim a bail differs based on the offence. An accused can claim a bail as a matter of right if he is accused of committing a bailable offence. On the other hand, a person accused of non-bailable offence cannot claim bail as a right. Understood? However, they are permitted to approach the court while they are being prosecuted. The decision to grant bail to the accused in non-bailable charges is up to the court's discretion. Let us see the issues in bail law one by one. Firstly, the Criminal Procedure Code does not define the word bail but only categories offences under the Indian Penal Code as bailable and non-bailable. Secondly, the CRPC empowers the magistrates to grant bail for bailable offence as a matter of right. Thirdly, the procedure leads to huge pendency of under trials. Fourthly, since there exists a framework for bail, many indiscriminate arrests happen even for non-cognizable offence. And lastly, the bail law glorifies the legacy of colonial era. It exists even today with some modifications. These are some of the issues associated with the bail law. Considering all this in Satyendar Kumar until vs CBI case of 2021, Supreme Court underlined that there is a pressing need for reform in laws related to bail. Supreme Court called on the government to consider framing a special separate legislation on the lines of law in United Kingdom. Secondly, Supreme Court also emphasized that even for cognizable offences, arrest is not mandatory and must be necessitated. Thirdly, it ruled that there was no need for bail application to be made while considering the applications under Section 88, 170, 204 and 209 of the Code. See, these sections relate to various stages of trial where a magistrate can decide on release of the accused. These range from power of the magistrate to take bond for appearance to the power to issue summons. The Supreme Court also held that in these circumstances, magistrates must routinely consider granting bail without insisting on separate bail application. Finally, the Supreme Court asked all the state governments and union territories to comply with the orders of the court and avoid indiscriminate arrest. That's all about this discussion. Let us move on to our next discussion. We have come to our final discussion. Recently, the water levels in Godavari and its tributaries continued to rise following the heavy rains and discharge of floodwaters from major reservoirs across the river. This is a recurring event that happens almost every year. Godavari is one of the most significant rivers in South India, right? So in this discussion, we shall see some important points about Godavari River in Prudim's point of view. Godavari is the largest peninsula river. The river originates from Trimbageshwar near Nashik in Maharashtra. Godavari flows towards eastward, passing through the states of Maharashtra, Telangana, Andhra Pradesh, Chhattisgarh and Odisha. And then it empties into Bay of Bengal. Let's take a closer look at some significant tributaries of Godavari one by one. The Paravara, Manchra and Manir are right bank tributaries of Godavari. Purna, Pranahita, Indravadi and Sabari are the left bank tributaries. In this, Pranahita has its own tributaries. They were Venganga, Penganga and Varda. See, Kumbha Mela, the famous Hindu festival, takes place on the banks of river Godavari in Nashik. That's why Godavari is called Dakshin Ganga or Ganges of South because of this cultural and historical importance. Next, we will see some important projects on Godavari. Polavaram Irrigation Project, also called Indra Sagar Project, situated in Andhra Pradesh. There were three important projects of Godavari in Telangana state. They were Kalishwaram Project, Sri Ram Sagar Project, Sadarmat Dam. So these facts will be useful for 
map based questions in prelims examination. So with this information, let us move to our next part of discussion, prelims practice questions. Take a look at the first question. This question is about universal basic income. Look at the four statements. The first three statements are correct. The fourth statement is wrong because universal basic income requires negligible amount of bureaucratic involvement. It does not require a significant amount of bureaucratic involvement. So the fourth statement is wrong. The answer is C, only three. Moving on to the next question. So our next question is about Adichanallur site. Look at the statements. Here all the three statements are correct. Note that Thamirabharani river is also called Puranai river or Thin Puranai river. So the answer is C. Moving on to our next question. This question is about bail in Indian legal system. See, the bail is not an absolute right in Indian legal system. It is a discretionary power with the courts. So the court takes into account several factors before making a decision including the nature and gravity of offence. So the correct option is B. That is, the bail is discretionary power of the court and it can be granted based on various factors. All the other statements are wrong. The prelims questions are over. Now take a look at these mains questions. Try to write the answer for this mains question and post it in the comment section. Now we have come to the end of our discussion. If you like the video, please share it with your friends. And also subscribe to Shankar IAS Academy YouTube channel. Thank you.